Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Gianluca Rovesti, and uh, I am uh, one of the organizers of this uh, webinars. Today, we have the pleasure and the honor to have with us uh, Dr. Jan Nisdo from Prague. Hi, Jan. Hi, everybody. Apart making uh, all the list uh, of his achievement, graduation, etc. Uh, I'd like to underline the fact that I was always very impressed by his ideas and how he manages cases. So uh, we will uh, uh, attend this lecture that uh, in most cases, uh, most of the cases are not actually treated with the kind of implants or instrument that we as a company suggest but nevertheless i think it's very interesting because the ideas that are behind the, the treatment that jan will show us are the important thing about our profession a couple of information technical ones uh, we will have two short breaks, advertisement breaks. They are two minutes breaks, so don't worry. We don't want to bother you too much with this kind of uh, breaks. And uh, at the end of the lecture that is scheduled as one hour, and then of course can be 55 minutes or one on a 10, it doesn't make any difference, but we will have the session of, sorry, the question session, meaning that you can ask uh, questions. Uh, the way to ask is by typing your question on the, the window that the chat window that you have on the right of your screen. So you can uh, type the question and Jan can see the question and will answer in benefit of everybody listening. And the last thing is, if someone of you or your friends uh, was not in the condition to attend the webinar, we are recording the webinar and we will put on your, our, sorry, um, uh, YouTube channel so that you can uh, have a look or revise if something was not clear enough first attempt on uh, our YouTube channel. If uh, for those uh, of you that are interested in attending other webinars, we are organizing every Wednesday afternoon this kind of uh, event and you can see and check the list of dates and topics on uh, our website that is uh, ad uh, slash mayora.eu uh, so you can check for the list 
that you may be interested in, in attending. So I don't want to waste more time and I think uh, it's much better if we listen to our speaker. Okay, Jan, audience is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Gianluca. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to thank Gianluca and Almayora for inviting me for this meeting. Uh, it's a great honor, of course, um, to speak, uh, even though it's a very unusual way to talk to the audience through the internet, but, uh, well, that's the life we have to live now. Uh, today, my uh, lecture will be about uh, radius ulnar fractures in toy breed dogs, which is a topic that uh, probably everybody is um, interested in who's doing um, veterinary orthopedics because we see usually quite a lot of these cases. It's nothing uncommon. And as you all may know, um, these fractures can be challenging not because of their type of fracturing. They are mostly quite easy fractures, but the issues which are connected with wound healing, bone healing, and also implant selection. So, so let's roll. Um, well, we know that there was a long way from the wolf to what we all know today as uh, toy breeds or even cup breed dogs. I mean, the, the way we designed these dogs uh, became very unnatural. And it's not only about the limbs, uh, it's also about other issues which they have due to their dwarfism. Um, but regarding the bones, we have to think about some aspects that it's not only about the absolute or relative size of the bones related to the body size. Um, it's also about the morphology of the bones that changed in these very small dogs. Uh, the proportions are diff different than in the large breed dogs. And also what I will show you is that the, the structure and the microstructure of these bones is quite different of what we see in the large breed dogs. These small dogs found a new habitat in their owner's arms and therefore the, the trauma they suffer is very different from what we see in a large breed dog. So most of the times it's not a hit by car or something like that. They just jump out of the arm of the owner. So if it's a really small dog jumping from one meter 50 high, it's a severe trauma even though it's considered to be minor trauma. But in relation to the size of the dog, it's quite a jump. Um, and that's the, actually the most common reason for antibrachial fractures in my practice. So the people come in and they say, oh yeah, I, I took my dog uh, in the arms and then he suddenly jumped out of the arm and then he broke one or both front limbs. That's a typical history. So it's a fall down, it's a fall down trauma. And uh, probably this is not a new thing. Uh, we see through the history that these dogs were always very popular, especially with ladies. But nowadays we have the chance to cure these dogs. That's the difference between what's now and what was in the past. Now, this is a very interesting study. It's a few years old, but it showed on cross-sectional uh, CT scans, comparing different levels of the radius that it's not only about the size of the dogs and the proportions, but it's also about the uh, relation between the cortical and cancellous bone and the distal aspect of the radius. And that's pretty important because as we can see here on the pictures, there is in the normal radius and in the normal ulna some uh, lumen there is, there is space in between the cortices. So it's more a tubular structure. Whereas in the small breed dogs, it's nearly compact and we have mostly very, very, very few uh, cancellous bone in the distal aspect of the radius uh, where they typically break. And in the ulna, there is no cancellous bone at all, which makes it a little bit more complicated for healing as well. So this is kind of the graphical comparison, what we see in the small breed dog and what we see in the large breed dog. So the, the small, small dogs have more a flat bone without any uh, 
bone cavity, let's say, so it's more comparable to a chopstick, whereas the large breed dogs has the distal radius with a huge uh, cavity, so we have four walls of the cortis, cortex in the bone, and it's more comparable to a bamboo, which is a big difference in the mechanical um, loading um, acceptance of the bone. So, by talking about mechanical bo uh, loading, every bone which is loaded needs to have some degree of elasticity, um, especially in a sudden uh, strong stress which is forced to the bone when the dog, for example, jumps from high. So the bone has to be, to a certain point, elastic. Uh, that's microelasticity, but if there is uh, no uh, cavitary uh, structure in the bone, it is more prone to uh, fail and break uh, even with relatively small traumas. And the compact bone is much more prone to these fractures as we know. And it's also very small, but that's, that's in the relation to the dog, not the, main, uh, not the most important thing. And that was uh, also a quite old paper published by Randy de Bourdieu and Loïc de Jardin in, in the 90s, in the late 90s, but they showed already at that time, because of course these troubles with the small dogs were actually important also in the 90s and in the 80s, and that time they, they wanted to show why these dogs have these problems with bone healing. And um, what they proved on, on uh, microimages of histological sections of the bones that there is not only different vascularization in the periosteal area uh, because the periosteum is very weak, but also inside the bone. So the intraosseous blood vessels are much less and uh, that makes it more difficult for later reparation process, which you expect after you fix the fracture. So the bone healing is in theory uh, much slower in the small breed dogs because of less vascular supply and also because of very few soft tissues around the area where they break. So these are the most important aspects which lead to the complications that we see in the miniature dogs. On top of that, talking about periosteal vascularization, we have to keep in mind that um, if we plate, for example, such a fracture, and if we use, let's say, a conventional plate, also the trauma caused by surgery and the plate itself after application on the bone can be quite um, important and it can slow down the healing process or even make a failure of the healing process because of uh, the destruction of the periosteal uh, vascularization. Uh, this is an important study done by Antonio Pozzi's group and they showed the differences um, in, the, in the vascularity of the periosteum after bone plating. So if we put these things together that we have not too much vascularity in the distal radius in the very small dogs, we have a very weak periosteal vascularization, we have nearly no soft tissues at all in the area of the distal antebrachium. We have a small bone, which is in the relation to the size, um, also too compact. Um, well, then we deal with a scenario, uh, which is not surprisingly connected with a lot of potential complications. So that's the reasons why we have the trouble with the toy dogs. And what, what are the troubles that we see very, very commonly? Most of the time we see atrophic bone unions. Sometimes we see a general bone atrophy um, due mostly due to some attempts of external co-optation. Uh, if, you, if you put a cast on such a small limb for three weeks, you will see a dramatic bone loss. It will be a, like an osteoporotic destruction of the bone. We see a lot of these dogs with chronic infection. They don't show the classic purulent osteomyelitis like we see in the large breed dogs. Usually it's just uh, a decent lysis, but they just don't heal. And if you sample these fractures, uh, many times you 
come back with a chronic staphylococcus intermedius uh, infection, which is uh, which is not surprising, even though it doesn't look like this dramatic exploding osteomyelitis that we see in the textbooks. When the result of all of this is that we have many malunions when we wait long enough and we are lucky enough that the bone heals or we have non-unions forever. And even if we fix them, uh, due to the characteristics of the bone and due to the size of the bone and due to the size of many implants, we see some cases of refracture later on just because our implants are causing further destruction to the bone and they weaken the bone and the entrance of the screws. So if we decide to explant such a dog too early, they may break through the bone, through the drill hole of the, of the screw. That's something which usually does not happen in large breed dogs or medium sized dogs. That's a typical problem in the small breeds and it's especially a problem uh, in the antibrachial fracture areas. So let's get a little bit more practical. I will start with the first one, which is a really typical one. That's, that's what we see all the time. Uh, so this first case is Ulin. Ulin is a five month old Pomeranian dog. Uh, they become now very popular um, for some reason. Uh, they are so cute, and usually they bite. Um, this one was one and a half kilos heavy, <laughs> um, five months old, so quite young. And he jumped only from the chair. Well, the chair is quite high for a, for a 1.5 kilogram dog. And he suffered a distal antibrachial fracture. Uh, at the same time, we have to understand that there is some limitations for potential treatment in these dogs. If we have a five month old dog with still ongoing growth, they are open growth plates. So we have to be a little bit careful, not to touch too close to the um, to the growth plate, especially the distal radial growth plate, because there can be a significant risk of uh, later um, angular dimp deformity or um, arrest of the radial growth, which can cause other complications. So Ulin was really typical. This is just a few cases and they, they all look more or less the same as you can see. And there are different breeds. One is a Yorkie, Beaver, Pomerania, Rattler. Uh, all very small dogs and all have the same pattern of fracturing. They, they, I mean, there is a little difference in the high from some are really exarticular, some are a little bit higher, but all of them are in the distal metaphysis of the radius. And all are dislocated the same way. It's always the same uh, medial dislocation and this just follows the forceps, forces um, which are applied on the bone when the dog is jumping from the high. So that's a typical pattern. So what is the decision making in case like Ulin? So as I said, conservative management is leading to big, big complications. And I would consider cons conservative management nowadays as a non leg artist uh, approach. And you can get in serious troubles if you decide to treat such a dog and you will end up with a nightmare uh, atrophic bone union and the people are suing you because then you are on the wrong side. So as we know from the literature, there is a 80, over 80% 80 complication rate in these small breed dogs. And this is just uh, absurd. So nobody should decide ever to treat these dogs with a cast. It's a no-go. And we have to expect in nearly every dog a catastrophic failure. And you will never achieve good bone healing because these fractures, even if they heal somehow, they get a malunion because they are quite dislocated, as you can see on Ulin's case. So how about external fixators? I know that Gianluca is a big fan of uh, external fixators. I was treating some of these small dogs years ago with XFIX, but that was more because of the lack of other options. But still, linear external fixation is, a, is an option and there is, there is literature out there. There is also a good evidence that if you apply external fixators well, uh, you can achieve relatively good outcomes with a relatively low complication rate as long as you work minimally invasive 
and you do not destroy too much um, soft tissue and vasculature around the fracture site. Now, this is a good example from a Japanese group. Um, of course, in, in Japan, you treat mostly dogs like this, so they are the best on planet to treat very small dogs. And we have to trust them that they do a real good job. And it seems to be that with this system they published, it's a freehand X-Fix with acrylate only. Um, they can achieve very good results. And that's what they showed here on quite a good number of uh, miniature dogs treated only with this uh, simple external fix wires and acrylate. The problem with this is once you have to have a relatively long distal fragment. You can see on the image from the paper that this dog is not exactly the pattern that we see in these Yorkies and these other small dogs because the fracture is nearly in the diaphysis. So you have a lot of bone left over to put your three pins um, in the distal segment and you are on the good side. If it's very low, if it's very near the joint, you will get in real troubles to get a good two pins at least into the distal segment and then it may get a little bit complicated. So for me, this would be an option if I decide maybe for cost reasons to go for X-Fix only if I have a more a diaphysial than a metaphysial fracture. Then it may be okay and then probably we should go for a mini-invasive approach. Now this is a case which was given to me by Gianluca and as I said, he's, he's really skilled with external fixators and they have a very nice system um, on hand with Admayora, I have it here as well, without, uh, with the radiolucent clamps. They are really nice for the very small dogs and it's a relatively cheap um, system that you can use uh, in clients where you are limited in the costs. And that's the same situation, you see a relatively far proximal fracture, so there you can quite nicely apply three pins in the distal segment and you will end up with a, such a nice bone healing like in this case. Um, what I would see as a little problem, just practically, uh, this external fixator is kind of a big device on the small limb. And especially if you have both limbs affected like in this dog, it can cause a little discomfort or more discomfort in the dog when he tries walking with this and you have to be very careful to bandage these fixators very well so that they don't hang the the wires um, in the other side of the fixator and they, they don't destroy the fixation just by, by mechanical uh, implications. So it's an option. I don't say it's, uh, it's a bad option. I just think it's an option which is um, reserved for certain cases. For me, nowadays, as we work with the different systems, linear external fixator is really rarely used in fractures, especially in toy breeds, for me. Now, the next step would be to think about the circular um, external fixator. Um, yeah, again, it's the same issue. We have many times a small distal fragment and we have uh, a thickness of the ring, of the most distal ring that you have to use for the two cross pins on the circular external fixators. Um, at the same time, we have to see again the problem with a relatively bulky device that has a physiotherapeutic effect. The dog is forced to walk with the limb because it's so heavy that he has to put the limb on the floor. So that may be a positive aspect. But anyway, if it's a bilateral fracture, it will be a real problem. And if it's a very small dog, and if it's a very small distal segment, it can be also a real issue. So um, there are people like Antonio Ferretti uh, or, or um, uh, Lisa Piras, uh, these published, they publish these papers. They can use this probably very well in also very small dogs and I'm sure they can achieve really good results. But you have to be very skilled with circular X-Fix. You have to know how to apply it well. And you have to be sure that you do not cause uh, more damage, especially uh, when you uh, apply the cross pins the wrong way. You can cause uh, 
uh, later on when you remove the device you can cause a big hole in the in the bone as you can see in this uh, paper as well and then you you end up with a fracture uh, in the in the pin side so these are complications which i do not like to see um, and i don't think it's necessary if it's not an open infected fracture to use a circular x fix in most of the cases and as Yves one of the uh, grandfathers of circular external fixators from France, uh, once said, uh, circular fixators are great, but they have 100% complication rate. And that's actually true. That's also my experience with circular X-Fix. When I use them for other things like uh, distraction osteogenesis, you have always issues with these. So we have to expect more work with the dog during bone healing than if you just fix the bone and let it go. But it is a good option and it's published that it's feasible to use this in very small dogs. This is again um, a case provided by Gianluca. It's amazing for me. Uh, it's a very tiny dog uh, with this spacey thing on the limb. Um, and that's really cool. And, and, and he achieved a wonderful bone healing. But as I said, you have to be really good with this. Conventional bone plating is what is still used mostly. Um, and that was my last conventional bone plating in a miniature dog. It was 2014, it was a toy poodle. And that was okay. I mean, we did quite a lot of these and um, you have to lose a lot of screws, much more than we are used now. Uh, the plate had to be quite long, even though it was a distal um, antibrachial fracture, the plate had to bridge most of the radius to apply enough stability and to avoid backup of the screws later on. Um, it was relatively cheap and it was again limited sometimes when the fracture was very, very distal. So if there was only space for one good screw, then either you had to use some um, T-plates. At that time, there were no good T-plates for two zero screws or smaller. Nowadays, they are, um, but that was, that was one of the big problems um, like five years, six years ago. Um, and implant loosening was a, was a very common problem, especially screw loosening with the time. Um, but it is an option and there are plenty of papers out there showing that you can um, use it with a good success rate. Um, this is just uh, again a paper from, from Japan as expected. They have the most experience. So they used uh, in 65 dogs uh, just conventional cutable plates with quite good results. Um, but you see that they have to use quite a lot of um, screws. They used relatively short plates. I would be a little bit afraid using that short plates in, um, in a conventional system, but you can see that they achieved good results. In these plates, the screws were placed very tight next to each other. So maybe therefore you could use a shorter one and they got, got good results and they had to sometimes explant staged which we come to later. I will tell you more about this staged, staged uh, de-arrangement of internal fixation. Um, some studies used also omentum and grafting. Uh, grafting is always a question for me in this miniature dogs. I don't know where you get the graft. I usually graft from the proximal humerus, but if you want to graft it from the proximal humerus in a, in a 1.5 kilogram dog, you have a good chance that you create a second fracture in the humerus. So uh, it's a bit more complicated to get a good graft. In this study, they, they used omentum with quite a good outcome, but I mean, that's more invasive and uh, it's probably making the risk for infection a little bit higher. And again, you see, you have to use relatively long plates with a lot of screws, a lot of, because otherwise they will pop out. And these are some of the catastrophic scenarios, just, just a few because unfortunately, at least in my practice, I see a lot of really crazy, crazy uh, 
applications of uh, bone plating in, in any size of the dogs, but especially in the small breed dogs. And sometimes you do not understand why this or how this could happen, like in this Pomeranian, which ended up with some strange plating from Ulna to somewhere. Um, in this Italian Greyhound, they, they used uh, 2.7 screws. So what happened, like one week later, the dog suffered a second fracture through the uh, through the screw hole because it was just way too big. It was uh, nearly two thirds of the dia diameter of the bone. So that's crazy. Some some get a lot of infection. Sometimes they are more lucky, like this Yorkie that ended up with a completely healed ulna. That makes the story a little bit more easy to deal with. But some are less lucky, like this Jack Russell with a dramatic angular deformity that had to be corrected afterward. So uh, there is a good potential for messing it up, especially if you're not uh, careful enough. And sometimes you get scenarios like this crazy case from my good friend, George, from Portugal. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether he treated this dog already or still is uh, making his thoughts how to deal with this because this dog has only two limbs because uh, the ipsilateral knee is a, not a grade four, it's a grade six uh, patella luxation. It's a useless limb and it's not fixable with uh, no osteotomy technique. So this dog has only two healthy limbs and is walking on the flex carpus because uh, of this crazy, um, well, attempt of uh, uh, osteosynthesis which finally, that's, that's sometimes it's really crazy, it healed. I mean, the bone is, is completely healed, but a little bit in the wrong, wrong direction. And that makes the story quite complicated in such a case. There are papers out there um, that are a little bit controversial. Um, usually, Germans are very precise, but in this case, I was kind of, uh, well, not say shocked, but a little bit concerned about um, this technique that was published by the Brumberg Group uh, from Berlin. Because what they were using was this uh, very strange um, combination of circlaging and uh, pins drilled and somehow bent into the bones. I would say this is a total no-go. Um, I don't know how much complications they have, in fact, and whether they ever applied it after this paper. But if you if you want to apply four or six or even more circlage uh, wires on a, a radius of a, of a Yorkie, you will probably kill the bone. You will get in real trouble. Also, it's questionable that the stability is, is um, achieved. Uh, as you can see that some of these bones healed in a, quite a procurvatum and, and the risk of um, pinhole fractures is, is significant. So with all respect, uh, I, I, would, I would discourage to use such techniques, even though it may be super cheap. But, you know, if you, if you try to do things super cheap, usually you end up with a big catastrophe and then it's getting much more expensive later on and it's much more trouble. So um, in these cases, I would not look for the cheapest option. I would look always for the best option available. And this is the presence. And that's what, that's what most of the people that I know are using commonly nowadays. Um, and that's the use of locking plates. And there are, as you know, many, many systems now on the market. Uh, it's not that long ago that was the first paper published again by Randy Baudrier. Um, and um, they used the Sinter system, the mini Sinter system with two zero screws, which is nice, but it's still quite bulky. It's quite big. But at that time, I think there were no locking screws of smaller size available. It's a few years ago. Uh, it was published in the VCOT. Um, that's another paper uh, where they used uh, uh, another um, system that used already uh, also smaller screw sizes. And what you can see is typically what we, is, is also in our experience that you can use for these distal and fractures, relatively short plates 
and very few screws. There's no need to have uh, six, seven, eight screws. Mostly you need two, four, two screws on each side as a minimum, and that's fine. So uh, it's starting. There are more papers coming up now. This is a Korean paper where they have a, a little bit crazy uh, system with 1.2 million uh, millimeter diameter screws well i could hardly see such a screw but uh, they use it but because they are so tiny and so small even in these small breed dogs they seem to be a little bit worried so you see they use mostly at least six or eight screws um, so i think it's it's not ideal to go that small in my experience most of the very small dogs can be very well done with uh, 1.3 or 1.7 millimeter screws meaning average 1.5. 1 1.2 is, is, is quite small. And I'm not sure how, how well they grip, but it's also about the application. If you use these super small screws, it's getting more risky for breaking the screw in your hand or in the bone. And if you have only two screws available and in the distal fragment and you have, to, and you have one broken, then, then you may be in, in, in real trouble. So I think uh, biologically, uh, we do not need to go below 1.3 millimeters. So this is maybe way too small. So why is, why is uh, locking plates now uh, that popular? Everybody knows probably I can make it short that it's, it's, a, it's a different fixation techniques as it, it works more like a external fixator inside. So that's for, therefore people call it also internal fixator. Um, the good thing is it can save the periosteum, which we need, especially in the small breeds. So we do not compress the plate uh, to the bone, but we, like we do with a DCP plate or a, a conventional bridging plate, but we conserve uh, under the plate a little space. It can be a very, very small space, but it's enough for the vasculature to survive. And the stress is transferred by the, by the implant, like it is in the, standard linear external fixator. So it's indeed an uh, internal fixation system. It's mostly angle stable. There are systems out there, they are polyaxial, so where you can angle the screws. I personally use an uh, angle stable system mostly. That means all the screws are in 90 degrees angle to the plate. And most of the times it's, it's not a problem for me. But if you like to angle your screws for some reason, they are very nice um, systems which have, a, which have an angulation possibility. Mostly it's limited, maybe to 30 degrees or something like this, but maybe it's helpful. And there is no stress on the bone and there's no pressure on the bone and, and you need very few screws. And that's the point. And also the screws do not need to be bicortical in all cases. It's fine to have monocorticals on both sides. If you use only monocorticals, then probably you should have at least three screws on each side of a fracture in a small dog, okay? Even at Mayora has a very nice um, system that, that was introduced to me by uh, Gianluca. It's, um, they call it OstiLock. Um, it's interesting because you can use also uh, conventional screws so you do not need to use only uh, locking screws. It's, uh, I think, 1.5 millimeter, if I'm not mistaken. Um, actually, in these very small dogs, mostly I do not need much compression. So because the, the fracture is uh, realigned and then I do not care that much about compression. And I'm not sure how much compression really we can achieve with this micro systems. But this system allows you, for any case, if you want to compress, there is a compression hole. Uh, and it, it seems to be um, nicely um, uh, mo modelable, so you can, you can apply it on the individual aspect of the bone as you need. It's not very uh, rigid in the, in, the, in the form. And you can probably cut it as far as I see. That was a case that was um, uh, Dr. Herrero's case where they used the malunion. Uh, they, they made an osteotomy um, guided by a circular X-fix and then they applied this um, osteolog plate. 
and for me it looks quite good i mean um double plating i do myself um, quite a lot and in this case probably it was a very well chosen technique and as far as i could see the results it was quite good so thanks for giving me these pictures um that's what i use mostly um that's what i wanted to show you that you do not need to apply uh, the plate on the flat on the bone and therefore you do not need to model the plate on the bone that much in this case um, it's it's also important to understand that if you have such a situation where the surgeon before was a little bit too uh, creative let's say and he crossed not only the carpus but he did not um, realign the bones and he got infection in there and there was a staphylococcus infection in this in this dog you can still use a plate for internal fixation even though you have an infection and that's a that's a perfect case to show because you see after nine weeks it takes a little bit longer uh, but you have after nine weeks complete bone healing um, in this case i had to use a very long plate because there was a lot of holes in this bone so uh, it was necessary but even though we used a big long plate and we used a lot of screws you can see that after nine weeks there are no signs of infection there are no signs of screw loosening and the dog healed 100 percent of course you have to graph these cases it was a jack russell terrier but um, what it shows is that if you use these locking systems and you achieve this uh, rigid stability you can have a very 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 good outcome even if you have infection from the previous surgery okay i think now is the time for a break so i will log off for a moment Okay, so let's go back to Ulin. Um, so what I choose in Ulin's case is what I usually do in these small dogs. Uh, I'm using this system uh, for internal fixator, uh, which is called Fixin. Many of you may know it. Um, in principle, it's a, it's a locking uh, screw system with a conical coupling. So the the, the way it's uh, it's coupled it's coupling the plate. Um, with the screw is a bit different than in the others. Um, conical coupling uh, is, is something which is quite nice with this very, very small um, plates because you don't have to screw it in, you just tighten slowly and you don't strip it. So it's less risky to break the, um, to break the screw in the plate. And there is a system of 1.7 and 1.3 millimeters, so um, we have a better chance uh, to pick the right screw for the right patient if it's very small. So that's the way we apply, and 
you see, you have to be really gentle when you tighten these screws. The other thing is, um, what I like in these systems is that you can use two small pins to fix the plate on the bone for temporal fixation for alignment. So you have the bone well aligned with your um, uh, with your plate, uh, and you do not get some some malalignment afterward when you fix the first screws. Um, but just be very careful with the tightening. Tightening is, is really important in these super small dogs. So that was the situation with Ulin. Um, we used only four screws, as you can see. Uh, they were all 1.7 millimeters, and we do not use any bandage. I usually do not bandage these small dogs. I don't see any reason. Most of them are weight-bearing after um, two days, three days. Um, but the people have to keep them, of course, short. We usually recommend cage rest afterward. One little trick how to uh, reduce the fracture, and this is something that many people really struggle with, um, is that you can use in these locking plates the plate itself for reduction of the fracture. What I mean is that you put the plate on the distal segment of the fracture, you put two screws or maybe only one screw is enough, which you tighten. And you have to be sure that your plate is well oriented in the relation to the carpal joint. And then you use the plate as a level, practically a level arm to realign this small distal fragment to the proximal segment. And then you fix it with the, with the rest of the screws. So that's a little trick. You do not have to fiddle around and uh, apply um, or uh, realign with your fingers and then try to put the plate on the realigned bone you simply start with the distal <coughs> sorry with the distal segment and then you realign by using the plate itself now in Ulin's case that was uh, the result so you can see that after three weeks Ulin was growing quite a bit after eight weeks he was still growing quite a bit the fracture was healing perfectly as is usually expected in these young dogs, they heal very well, very quickly. So already after three weeks, uh, the fracture is fully healed. Now that would be maybe the time where you could consider explantation and some people do explant these dogs once they see the full bone healing. Um, I don't think it's always necessary uh, and I explant usually this micro dogs only when I have to. But there is a problem that we have to keep in mind and that we will talk about later, uh, which may cause or may give you reason to explant. One little thing is about this uh, extremely distal fragments uh, that you can use this uh, T plates um, in a little bit different way because um, as, the, as the distal bone segment is quite small and narrow, you may be uh, with one of the screw out of the bone if you do not flex it. So you can use this Mickey Mouse plate, we call it Mickey Mouse plate, uh, to bend the ears uh, concentrically so that you can purchase the bone on the other side with both screws. And that's a, quite a nice trick with, uh, with this super distal segment uh, fragments um, where you have really only a few millimeters of bone and you need to put these two, uh, two screws in so by flexing them uh, a little bit, you will engage quite a good bone stop. These are just examples of uh, the use of the T plates or Mickey Mouse plates. That's another one. Um, this is something what we see uh, that was again, a jump, jump from high from the arm of the owner and it's a Pride Rattler. It's a Czech breed, uh, horribly small. Um, and what he managed was uh, a super distal uh, fracture on one side and uh, radial carpal bone luxation with uh, bilateral steroid fracture on the other side. So that's, of course, a little bit challenging. But as you can see, for the fracture, it's quite nice to use uh, the Mickey Mouse plate and it healed super fast. And it's only four screws. Um, you have to be very close to the joint, so be careful. You have to put needles into the joint to see where your joint surface is. 
but um, with a little luck, um, you can you can achieve quite a good good um, alignment, and the plate is is perfect for that. On the other side, of course, there was a different approach, so we had to fix the radio couple board and uh, the steroid and uh, put a temporal transarticular X fix for four weeks. Um, but they they heal very well, even though it looks horrible with this um, carpal bone luxation. Usually, the function is quite well afterwards. So uh, the straight support is the is the most common use. If you have enough bone, like in this case, that's the super small uh, again prag rattler. I think it was nine hundred grams or something like that. And uh, you can see that the plate is still quite big, but four screws are plenty enough for that, such a case. The the calibration ball is one centimeter, so you can imagine the size of this very small dog. Uh, the one on the on the left was one of the earlier cases. Uh, at that time, I was still in the in the mode of uh, standard plating for the whole radius. Nowadays, I never never do such a long plate. Um, on, a, on a distal fracture is no need. Uh, you can use much smaller, shorter. And that's what we typically see. They heal very well. Even if we have bone loss, if we have to put some bone substitutes. Uh, even if you have only, like in this uh, four kilogram Yorkie, that's a bigger dog. Uh, actually, it was only on two screws. The other two screws were useless, but it healed super fast. So that's Uli. Uh, it's a lovely dog. Um, he got more and more lovely with time. And 14 weeks after surgery, uh, we could see something that we call stress protection. Stress protection is uh, a very typical problem in these very small dogs. And I will show you a little bit closer. Um, so this is nine uh, months post-op. And if we see after eight weeks, the ulna, and if we see it after 14 weeks, you see the ulna uh, has shrinked to the half, and even the radius started shrinking. So now it would still be an option to explant completely, but it's getting a little bit risky. So if you explant this small dog completely, you may get a screw hole fracture. But you can avoid a big surgery just with a very mini invasive approach where you do a very, very, very small approach to uh, two screws and you just selectively explant two screws. That's enough. And uh, you can see after a few weeks, the bone will just grow back. It's like a miracle because you allow the bone to wear uh, more weight uh, and the screws and the plate are taking less weight. Sometimes I just loosen a little bit the locking mechanism of the, real, of, the, of the remaining screws so the plate stays there just to be on the safe side. I even had a case where I decided just to leave the plate in without any screws. Uh, and that's also possible because sometimes uh, the plate is partially integrated in the bone, especially at the ends, like you can see here in this case. And if you just remove all the screws, the place there is there, a little like an internal prothesis, but it doesn't cause any stress protection anymore, but it will avoid that the dog will suffer a fracture. Stress protection can be really dramatic, uh, like you can see in this Italian Greyhound, it was a three kilogram dog and somebody wanted to be really on the safe side, uh, so I don't know how many screws they use, but it was a lot of, and then some circlash wires, and then they break the bit, and well, they realigned the bone quite well, no doubt, and probably the surgeon was quite happy with the result when he saw it after the surgery. The problem was that eight months after the surgery, and nobody cared about the dog in between, the dog started to be lame because the whole radius practically disappeared. 40% of the radius are gone. And that's a problem. You cannot leave such a piece of chunk in the limb instead of the radius. You have to do something to get uh, biology back to the bone. So in this case, what we did, um, we explanted, of course, uh, this thing. There was no infection, by the way, so it was a sterile uh, atrophy 
and we were bridging it with the long locking plates just uh, removed and lock the 40% uh, percent of the um, useless um, small radius that was like uh, you can bend it uh, it was like cartilage so we take it out and then we took a rip uh, and uh, cancel this bone graft and the rip was just pressed fit so it was not screwed in there was no implant holding the rib in place it was just cut at exactly the length we needed to cover the uh, the gap and a little bone graft and it was quite interesting how this heals because first you get uh, a nice healing but you see there is atrophy going on that was the point at week six when we started to expand these dogs uh, selectively and um, the last image is uh, quite a recent one uh, and we are going to explant now the dog completely so um, because the, the bone is strong enough to hold it but it took quite a long time and you can see that that even the rib can remodel quite nicely uh, to a new radius even though you have to be careful um, not to leave it uh, out of sight and check it in the regular uh, regular times for um, for atrophy and now last but not least a real um, challenging case and these cases do happen and this case is challenging for many reasons it was again an italian greyhound so this is a lecture for italian company so i use a lot of italian dogs here um, she was lily was four months when she again fell from the arms of the owner what else and you can see that the the fracture is quite complex. It's a, it's a dash fracture where, uh, uh, where the, the ulna is fractured, the, the radius fractured on two, two spots. And it's a very, very young dog. It's four months old. So there is some significant growth expected in this dog. And there was a question, what about the distal growth plate of the ulna? Because it looked differently and it was probably damaged. And that was my mistake so i don't want to show you only the perfect cases but i want to show you also the cases where my i, I do myself a mistakes just by ignoring uh, small things which have a big impact later on so i just ignored uh, the distal ulna and i was just thinking about how to fix the radius and that's what we did um, i used double plating uh, mickey mouse plate distally uh, because the, the distal fragment was very short and I didn't want to cross with the implant uh, the growth plate. As you can see, we are just, just, just above the growth plate, very, very, very narrow margin. And for the proximal fracture, we used the medial plate. Uh, that was a simple one. Um, I was quite happy with the reduction and uh, the dog was walking nearly immediately and it was everything was happy and we could see that we are good with the growth plate because I was concerned about the dog growing further with a damaged radial growth plate it would be a problem. And we did not touch the ulna because the fracture reduced by the reduction of the radius itself. Yeah, well, that was four weeks after the surgery and you can already see some problems. You can see that the dog was growing quite a lot, uh, four millimeters in four weeks. That's a lot. He was growing proximally and he was growing distally, but the growth proximally was symmetrical. And the growth distally was asymmetrical and it was not asymmetrical because of damage of the growth plate because we can see that the plate is lifting up from the growth plate but it was asymmetrical because of the stagnation of growth in the ulna just because we ignored the damage of the ulna growth plate and the ulna stopped growing so we created an ongoing valgus deformity in this dog and you can see that the valgus deformity is quite severe it was also visible uh, and you can see a destruction also in the elbow joint which makes it even more complex and the dog was getting lame again after he was quite good for a few weeks now the question in such a case is what shall we do with this because um, uh, it's too early to explant you can still see um, that there is a fracture but what you can do in such a case 
before you start thinking about corrective osteotomies, as we have a dog which is now five months old with the potential of further growth, just make a distal ulnar osteotomy and hope the best. And that's what we did. That's a very primitive and quick surgery. Uh, so we removed the piece of ulna and we wait a few weeks. That's week eight after the surgery. You can see the ulna is atrophying, but we do not care because uh, the dog will walk anyway on the radius. But that was also the time where stress protection started because we had a lot of implants and uh, we decided to explant step by step. And that was the first partial explantation. Again, these are no big surgeries. I, I have a very short anesthesia for 10 minutes and make a mini approach because you can palpate the plate under the skin. You just screw out the screw through uh, a step incision and that's it. It's, it's one, uh, one staple or something like this. So it's not a big surgery and you can explain to the people that you have to do this even though you will not do a big damage to the dog. And at week 12, we explanted the distal plate. And at that time, you can see already how much of growth was following since after the fracture. And, um, and it realigned the dog uh, 15 weeks post-op was quite straight. Uh, that's a, just a follow-up scan. We wanted to be sure that we do not have any residual in, in deformity. There is, uh, there is a little valgus, but it's totally insignificant and clinically the dog, the dog was doing very, very well. So finally, even though I made the mistake because I should have cut the ulna immediately during the first surgery, um, there was a happy end for Lily. So what we can say finally is that uh, in standard DCP plates or standard plating, um, you may have complications related to the implant instability. So we see more screw migration, we see uh, plate breakage, uh, screw loosening, screw fractures, screw hole fractures. We see maybe more infections. With a locking plate, uh, the complications are the opposite. They are due to too much stability. So stress protection is a much bigger issue in a, stand, in, a, in a locking plate system than in a standard plate system. Um, the only exception was maybe the Italian Greyhound with his 200 screws in the radius. Um, in this study, uh, that was, I think, a French group, they had real good outcomes with a very low complication rate using uh, standard plating and relatively short screws. But what they did, and that's just in between the lines, all of these dogs had bandages or synthetic casts after the surgery, which I would say is something which we should avoid um, in these small breed dogs. So maybe you can achieve good outcomes, but you will cause other damage, especially to the carpal joint, and um, you will weaken the bone itself. And finally, there are still doubts, okay? We, we do not know, we do not have the evidence uh, whether locking plates are that much better than uh, standard plates. So presently, we should not say, hey, guys, forget about standard plating. Let's do only locking plates. My personal feeling is that I do have much, much better outcomes when I look on my numbers, but this is far away from evidence, okay? So we need much more studies, we need comparative studies, and we have to be really sure before we switch completely to uh, locking plate systems that this is the best way to go. Okay, that's just to show you that you can use it also in cats. Well, that's not a cat lecture, so I will not talk that much about it because cats are quite different especially their fractures are different and usually they are not fracturing by jumping from the owner's arm. Um, but um, yeah, well, that's just uh, the last slide to show and uh, a little concern, of course, that if we use this 
as a, as a main approach it's also also a cost factor of course so in in some areas you may be limited by the cost of these systems so i thank you for your attention i thank once again uh john luca for inviting me um uh, it was a great pleasure i will i will now just uh, close the lecture and uh, wait for for question if there are any questions Two, two minutes advertisement and then question. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. First of all, thank you very much, Jan, because I think you were able to concentrate in one hour, more or less, all the very important principles and potential techniques about the treatment of uh, radial fractures in toy breeds. So congratulations for the nice lecture. Thank you. Uh, while we are waiting for uh, questions, if any, I will take advantage, advantage of my moderator position to ask you a couple one. Sure. The first one is, um, first of all, of course, the leverage technique, I mean, using the plate as a le leverage tool, uh, it's, uh, I think, a very nice one. I, I, I think how important it is, for example, in pelvic fractures. Mm. Uh, but this, of course, requires a, quite an extensive open approach. Did you uh, have ever had the feeling that this kind of uh, uh, approach can in some way delay the, the, the healing or it doesn't make any difference? Mm, you know, I, I don't think it makes, a, at least for me, it doesn't make a big difference. I think in these very small dogs, you have no chance to do a, a MIPO approach uh, because it's just, anyway very very tiny and if you have to use uh, the distal fragment for um, realignment um, you need to um, be sure that you place your plate distally in the right orientation so you have to see the bone and you have to know very well where is the joint line of the car uh, of the carpus so it's unavoidable to expose uh, the area i try not to touch the, the periosteum in these cases so I'm quite quite careful about not stripping off anything from the from the bone and uh, one one more thing for or, or one important thing for me that I think is a, is a key point for a successful healing in any orthopedic surgery is uh, to be fast I mean the time um, is, is a real issue um, and 
you do not do any good to the dog if you fiddle around for two hours uh, on, a, on a simple fracture. So in, in these cases, I want to be done in 20 minutes and that's what it takes usually. So that's another reason why I do not use any more external fixators, especially you no know, ring fixators, because it takes me just too much time. I'm not that skilled with ring fixators and I have to pre-assembly them and it's, it's, it's too much time. And if I, if I have a distal antibrachium coming in with a small dog, I know I have to reserve 30 minutes surgery for it maximum. It's, it's a very quick surgery if you, if you can handle this, these cases. Um, and then if I work really fast, then I do not care that much about the exposure, uh, surgical exposure, if, if, if this answers your question. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the specific expertise in the, in the technique, especially for super fixator, can be a key point because yeah. otherwise you take the risk of uh, uh, spending too much time in performing the procedure. Okay, this of course would open a big topic, but now we are not dealing with that. Right yeah, now. yeah, I know. I know you can. You can also work very mini invasively with external fixators, um, but it just takes more time, and and it's uh, yeah. and you have to be good in it. Uh, you have to be trained yeah, 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 in, in using them because yeah. you can really mess them up uh, horribly with the external fixator. The small dogs and uh, another experience that I had in putting the plates uh, in very distal fractures of the radius is that uh, you should pay attention usually when it's very distal we have the tendency to put the plate as required very distal but with the flex carpal radiocarpal joint mm -hmm. This can be tricky because when the dog is weight bearing, it will bear weight with the extended radiocarpal joint. And in okay. some cases, the very top of the plate will impinge on the radiocarpal joint. And this can be a little bit tricky because it can be very painful if uh, yeah. it will impinge over that. And the second point is that sometimes, especially using thick plates, I remember, for example, some cases with the synthesis plate, mm. and I have to move and displace the common uh, digital extensor tendon that is dorsal, mm. and I replace it over the plate. I had some cases that were not able afterward to flex the carpal joint, simply that. They, they can just, it was not locked actually, yeah. but mechanically limited for fraction. Yeah, yeah there's is, there is the small tendon which is crossing exactly exactly in the distal metaphysis, which is the, I, I think is a flexor halusis or something is for the, for the thumb. So uh, honestly, uh, I usually, if I have to go that deep, I, I, I cut it and there's the, and even you can, you can try to suture, but this is mostly no way to suture these. Uh, because they are so tiny and and it's it's also difficult to stretch the tendon back over the plate to um to do this i think it's better than to put the plate on the tendon and as you say because then you can get a problem with uh, with the plate pressuring on the tendon so uh, that that's maybe the only thing regarding uh, the the impingement of the plate um what I usually do is I, I'm, I take needles and I, I, I probe the, the joint with needles. And as you imagine, the, the joint is concave. So we have to expect that the needle is entering the joint a little bit lower than the, the utmost uh, concavity of the joint. So you have, to, you have to keep anyway a little margin between the, uh, the, the probed end of the radius uh, because you have to expect that if you if you put the plate exactly at the edge that you you may enter with the screws inside the joint because there is some slight concavity. So usually I want to have let's say one millimeter or two millimeters if possible um, proximal from the carpal joint to be on the safe side. And yeah. that's, that's that's quite safe. I never had a case where I had to remove the plate um, because of impingement. 
it's it's the, I, I have this problem commonly in in, in partial carpal arthrodesis when you put it on the carpal uh, uh, radiocarpal bone, but that's 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 a different story. Yeah, yeah, of course. Can you see yourself yeah. the question yes. on the chat? Yeah, somebody's asking whether it's an orthopedic surgery here. <laughs> that was the first question. Yes, yes. it's an orthopedic surgery session, uh, lady. Um, Okay, uh, can you use the reduction by leverage also with the Mickey Mouse plate? Yes, yes, um, I usually put only one screw in the Mickey Mouse plate and tighten it, lock it, and then it's, it's you can, if you, it, it's actually easier with the Mickey Mouse plate because you have two screws uh, or two holes which are on one level and you have the joint line and you just have to be say, sure that the two screws are set on the bone in the parallel manner to the joint line uh, of the cart uh, of the carpus so it's it's even more easy because you can orientate um, yeah the plate uh, on the joint yeah please yes. note that uh, on the osteoloc uh, radial carp radial fracture mini radial fracture plate the two arms the distal arms are not exactly the same length Okay, yeah, it's different. Yeah. And this is done on purpose because if you are orienting the screws to the center of the bone, yeah, you won't have interference on the same plane by the two screws. Yeah. So one will be displaced a little bit from the other level of the of the screw. Yeah, but then, then it will be a little bit different with using the plate for leveling because um, you have to be sure that the rest of the plate will align with the radius and you cannot see as the, as the distal screws are not on the same, same height. Uh, so they are a little um, bit away. Yeah, but the radius are, uh, has the steroid process. So yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah it's fine. You can, you can use, definitely you can use uh, all these plates for, uh, for realignment. Yeah. Uh, second question. Do you have any problems with compartment syndrome, double plating of the radius? Uh, that's that, yeah. Well, that's about the the size of the implants, as Gianluca mentioned already. We could not, or I would not do this with uh, let's say synthesis plates, which are very thick, and uh, they then you have to apply a lot of tension on the suture when you close it up, and it may be impossible uh, to close the the wound uh, with a big bulky plate, uh, and especially with two plates. But by using these very flat systems, uh, like I showed you and like Osteolog is, I don't think it's an issue. They, these plates are uh, very, very narrow, so you can easily close the soft tissues um, and you hardly never have a problem with, uh, uh, with the risk of compartmentalization. If you, if you get to the feeling that your suture is too tight and you're, you're, you're afraid of compartment, then what I do usually, I, I match the whole limb. So I take a scalpel blade, uh, a small one, and I make small incisions all around the limb, um, just and stretching the, the skin by 50% by that. You don't have to care. These wounds, they close up in, in five days. It's, it's no problem. It's not. Then in these cases, you have to put a bandage on it for a few days because it's an open, uh, it makes, it's makes, makes an open approach for infection, but... Uh, you will avoid uh, compartmentalization. And so don't be worried about cutting all around the limb uh, wherever you feel there is tension because of course you have to expand swelling. And if it swells and you have no skin, then the limb will fall off. Yeah, that will, will be a problem. Yeah, a I question. have very, very few cases of uh, incipient of early compartment syndrome symptoms that in my experience usually started with uh, painful extension of the pole. And uh, in my experience, at least, we perform the same procedure that you described, incisions, but the incision should extend into the deep fascia of the antebrachium because no, mostly, the compartment yeah. is inside the deep fascia of the antebrachium. Yeah, but talking about the small dogs, I mean, you make a incision and you are, <laughs> you cannot, you cannot distinguish where you are. You yeah, know, yeah, 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 of course, step of course. Incision yeah, 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 of course, yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. 
Good. Check if we have some more some more questions. Okay, so just to uh, a quick reminder why we are waiting just a few seconds more, not not too much, but a few seconds more uh, waiting for potential other questions uh, that uh, who missed at least in part the the lecture from Jan Nisdo uh, can uh, see it again the uh, recorded recorded webinar on the YouTube channel that the, the address is uh, published in the first line and uh, if you we don't have any more questions ah, we will receive the certificate of attendance of this webinar and uh, a evaluation form i ask you please answer to the evaluation form because this is very important for us to understand what went wrong what was appreciated what was correct if you experience any problem and this will help us to do it even better if we can <laughs> achieve it in the future so uh if no more questions are coming up i thank you Jan, very much for you. your gorgeous presentation and of course keep in touch and uh, thank you everybody for attending this webinar see you next time next time next week we will have uh, uh, the next um, webinar will be on uh, minimally invasive uh, techniques for fracture reduction okay so next wednesday we will have and i'll be you have to <laughs> to take it Anyway, I I will be the, the speaker for next meeting. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Arrivederci. Take Bye. care. Arrivederci. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.